Good morning. Good morning. I want to welcome you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to this time of worship and pray that today uh, this celebration of Palm Sunday will bring us uh, closer to the way of Christ. Uh, speaking of Palm Sunday and palms, if you walked in and you didn't receive palms, I know that Elizabeth uh, and uh, Grace will probably be happy to uh, give you some palms. And also, uh, if you'd like to take some palms with you to deliver or give to somebody who may need, may, uh, need the extra support, oh, here they are. Could you please make sure that the people who might have walked in through that door, I, d I didn't see that they received palms. Did, you, did some of you not get palms? Raise your hand. Aha. Uh -huh. So, all right. <laughs> Thank you. All right. And so, I invite you to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. If somebody you know is in need of encouragement or extra support, to share with them um, a palm and, and just to tell them about the prayers of the congregation. And so uh, today as we look at this invitation of Christ to us, and uh, what I invite you to consider Jesus' parade into Jerusalem and what it means for us to follow in his way, to follow in his footsteps, and how the city was expecting him to enter as a triumphant king, as someone who would bring a revolution, a change, because they were living under occupation. And so Jesus was very intentional to live and to see and to show that his kingdom was of a different kind. His kingdom was about the way of love, of justice, of compassion. So he was not going to resist evil with evil, but walked into this uh, city to show the way of love. And that upset a lot of people, more so than any other revolution, because it really challenged the very foundations of how people believed things to be. And so we want to invite you today to consider how this parade and this invitation to enter into the holy city with Jesus will bring hope and change and love into your life. So we'll begin with a call to worship with uh, Sherry being our leader. Good morning, everyone. Glad to see you all here on Palm Sunday. I will be uh, having some helpers with the call to worship. At this time, if the helpers could come up, I'll introduce them. First, we have Lily and Rusty. Hi. Hi. And Grace. She was one of our greeters today. And Samantha and her little one, Reagan. I guess. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> so every time we say the word Hosanna, or maybe Hosanna, however you say it, Hosanna, they're going to wave their palms up and down and invite you to do the same thing. Okay. Very good. Here we go. Here we go. Ready? Ready? Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. Hosanna. Rejoice for the Lord is in our midst. Christ comes with joy and hope. Christ, Christ comes to set us free from fear. Hosanna. Hosanna, glory to God in the highest heaven. Amen. Amen. Thank and you very much. They Robert. can stay here if you want for the first hymn, they, because it has a lot of Hosannas. Oh, so yeah. it's the 
invite you to stand and join us in singing hymn number 89, Hosanna, Loud Hosanna. We invite you at this time to share any prayers of joy or concern that you may have. Uh, if you have something to share, just please raise your hand and you can share it wherever you are seated. Do you want me to share anything about Leslie or no? Continued prayers for her, for her recovery. And uh, Don, is it okay if I share? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Don is having a procedure on his heart on Tuesday, and so we will ask for prayers for him and for his healing, and uh, hopefully this will take care of whatever irregular heartbeat he's dealing with. Yes, Anna. Ninety years old. Okay, your boyfriend's uh, mother is having um, heart surgery, a procedure, and so we'll pray for her. What's her name? Helen. Helen. So prayers for Helen. I ask prayers for uh, the Vacanti family. Um, Michael Vacanti's mom uh, moved to more life last Thursday. We've been praying for her. She's been under hospice care. And so there will be a celebration of life for her on Tuesday. Any other prayers? Yeah. 
All right, we'll continue in prayer with uh, Sherry. How bold of Jesus to ride into Jerusalem at the holy time of Passover. He rode as a humble king. We hoped it was to claim the throne, but it was to claim our lives. Lord, Lord Jesus, let us walk with you the path to the cross. Each day as he taught, he was reminded of the faithlessness of those in power. He saw corruption and oppression at every turn in the temple. Lord Jesus, let us be aware of the seductiveness of power as we walk with you on the path to the cross. At supper one evening, he discharged one of his disciples, Judas, to go and do what he felt he must do. For the others, he gave a precious reminder of his love through the washing of their feet and through the sacrament of bread and wine. Lord Jesus, cleanse us and make us whole. Feed us the bread of life that we might be healed and strengthened. From the cross, he forgave the executioners and welcomed a thief to paradise. Lord Jesus, forgive us our trespasses and welcome us as repentant people into your paradise. We take a few moments of silence to bring our prayers before God. And we continue in prayer using the words our Lord Jesus Christ taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And considering uh, what Jesus had to deal with, and thinking about how he had to face the expectations of the people, a man by the, na by the name of Char Charles Fillmore from uh, the year 1936, uh, he had penned uh, this paraphrase of Psalm 23. And so I want to invite you to consider for a moment before we listen to his para paraphrase, uh, the context, the historical context. What was happening in 1936? What was that time period in our country? Depression. Depression. The Nazi power was rising, so so a lot of turmoil in the world. And so he wrote this uh, paraphrase: "The Lord is my banker; my credit is good. He maketh me to lie down in the consciousness of omnipresent abundance. He giveth me the key to his strong box." He restoreth my faith in his riches. He guideth me in the paths of prosperity for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk in the very shadow of debt, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy silver and thy gold, they secure me. Thou preparest a way for me in the presence of the collector. Thou fillest my wallet with plenty. My measure runneth over. Surely goodness and plenty will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall do business in the name of the Lord forever. What do you think of this psalm? How far is it from the actual psalm in the Bible? Pretty close. Pretty close? 
I would say it's pretty interesting. He followed the the rhythm of the psalm, but really missed the whole point of I shall not want. It sounds like this guy is wanting more. And there is a theology behind this, and I'm, I'm not trying to make fun of what somebody else would believe, but there is danger in, in the way we think about God sometimes, wanting God to give us power, wealth, and success. Because it only ends up feeding our egos, and it creates problems for us, but also for our neighbors. And so you can think of this man at the time when uh, people were feeling the pain of the economic crisis. It was important to him to think, okay, God is going to provide for me these material things, and then life was, is going to be good. So prosperity and power theologies are not new. They go back even in the, to biblical times. People have always struggled with this understanding that faith doesn't always mean your life is going to be easier. It doesn't mean, actually sometimes it, means, it may mean that your life is going to be harder. Faith does not protect us from the problems and struggles of the world. What it does, it helps transform us and the ways we seek happiness. The illusory ways of seeking happiness are about, okay, if, if I have enough money in my bank account, I'll be happy. How many people do you know who have a lot of money in their bank accounts that are really happy because of that? They wake up in the morning and say, gosh, isn't it wonderful I have a million dollars in my bank account? Life is wonderful. How many people do you know that have the best looks? And they wake up in the morning and say, gosh, I'm just gorgeous, so beautiful. I'm so happy because of that. I mean, average people, think about it. Or if you know somebody who has a lot of admirers, gee, look at that. Look at how many followers now I have in my account. Two million people are adoring me. I'm so happy because of that. And life is just that way. That's why these are illusions, because none of us, even if we have these things we think we need so desperately, the house, the job, or the relationship, or whatever it is, even when we have these things, we don't always, they don't always translate into happiness. They don't translate into peacefulness. They don't translate into a sense of fullness of life. In fact, most of the time they end up leading us down the path of wanting more. And so into this context of our human struggle is the story of Jesus entering into Jerusalem, facing the powers, facing the expectations of the people who wanted him to save them. And now the word, uh, the kiddos that shared with us their palms and they were, we were singing Hosanna. The word literally means save us, we beseech you. We are seeking salvation because they are expecting somebody to come in and overthrow the empire, the occupiers. So you can see what they were looking for. But Jesus had the long view of history. So what we're going to do to read our uh, scripture today from uh, Matthew 21, we're going to watch a video that is a reflective reading of this uh, scripture. And it has an artist who has a painting that goes with it and her reflection on what's going on in the reading. And so I hope as you listen to it to let that speak to you. Uh, maybe about something that's happening in the world, maybe that about something that's happening in your life. I invite, I invite you, you to engage in the ancient Benedictine practice of prayer called Visio Divina, or Divine Seeing. Visio Divina is a process of intentional seeing using images for deeper meditation. To begin, I invite you to center yourself by taking a deep breath
and relaxing your body as best you can. Allow your shoulders to lower away from your ears. Let your arms rest in your lap and let your feet be fully supported by the floor. Feel the weight of your body held by your chair. Breathe deeply once again. A reading from Matthew 21, 1 through 11. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied, and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, To tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. A reflection from the artist. Jerusalem is the daughter of Zion. In her, we see overlaid intricacies of architecture and city planning, the beauty of her people, the layout of her family tree, the importance of her lineage, the repetition of her ancient stories, the importance of her prophets, the telling of true, right, and good, the incredible way that we live into our story, into God's story. Here, in Matthew, as Jesus prepares to arrive in Jerusalem to lay down his life for God's children, he hearkens back to the past. He recalls a simple prophecy, repeated over the generations, taught and retaught. He must have the donkey and her colt in order to fully live into the story that had been prepared for him by God. In this image, I drew repetitive angles as a layer of architecture, a suggestion of lineage as the repetition of a path through time. I imagine that the architecture of a city and lineage of a people are related. Jesus quotes the prophets and acts on their words. Behind the patterns of prophecy in this image is a daughter. I portrayed her in a pose of listening memorizing, preparing to retell the story. I drew her as thoughtful and contemplative, aware that her future role is to pass the narrative. She will tell of a peasant king's call to love and fearlessness. And so I wondered what came to you as you listened to the story, first from scripture and then the reflection.
I know for me, in the first service, I was looking at the image of the girl, of the little girl, and I, it, what came to my mind is, is uh, the people and the little children of Ukraine, and thinking of how they're experiencing life right now, and the trauma of war that they're experiencing, and how in the story, you know, in the reflection, the artist is talking about this girl preparing to retell the story to others. And I thought of these children who will be retelling their story, the story of their trauma, the story of their fear, the story of their loss, uh, and how that really impacts a whole generation of children. We tend to not think about that, but to think of uh, the fact that, you know, a lot of times when we think of the parade of Jesus going into uh, Jerusalem, we think of the children waving their palms, but this was... To them, this was a political move. I mean, it, it's not that different from our modern day when you think about it. There is an occupying for force. There is resistance. The people want these people to be out. And so to think about how that would be impactful on the world for us in the days to come, in the years to come, as these children grow up, they're going to carry this pain in their hearts. And what would heal them? What would heal them? And I think these are the questions we tend to not ask or think about when we think, okay, look at Putin and what he's doing. I mean, the part of me, the human, really mundane part, wants to say somebody needs to take him out. He's causing a lot of trouble for the world. He's hurting so many people. But then, in the long view of history, looking of, uh, at Jesus and his example and thinking, look at this parade where people expected, expected Jesus to repay evil with evil. He, they expected him to come in as a conquering king and take out those Romans who were occupying, who were imposing their ways, their evil ways on the people. Jesus had a different plan because Jesus had a longer view of history. And, and to think about how sometimes even as Christians, we don't always stand on the right side of history. And thinking yesterday, there was uh, an article about the church in Russia. And I don't know if they're forced to say these things, but it is very hurtful for me to read the words of their leaders, the sermons that are being preached. Uh, one leader, the leader of the Orthodox Church there, is talking about holding back the Antichrist. So this, to them, they're justifying this war, thinking this is... Uh, you know, this is the lesser of two evils, and this is what we have to do in order to hold fast against the Antichrist. So to them, there is a justification. And, you know, when you think about it, as Christians, we don't always get it right. And I tread lightly whenever I think of judging another leader, a Christian leader, because I, you know, I don't know their circumstances. And as I said, I have no idea if this is really what he believes or he has to say these things or otherwise he would disappear too. But to know that these are things that people are thinking or even saying because they're fearful, they want security, they, they're living under uh, a regime that says you can't speak your mind. And thinking of Jesus, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus say to us today about these ways of hate, of fear, when the world is rife all the time with these models of power? And so to think a little bit about the context of why this is really important. This was in uh, the year thinking about the occupation. Now, most of us remember the dates of uh, what, when it happened for uh, Ukraine. Most of us remember that this war, and some people are counting the weeks. This is how many weeks this invasion has been uh, taking place. But in the old uh, world, also, there was this understanding also of seeing how long the occupation had been going on. 
and for the people, the, for the Israelites. So the people of Jesus had been living under the Roman occupation uh, since the year 63 uh, before the Common Era. So it had been a long time since they would experienced their freedom. And the problem, of course, is that the Romans, they allowed other people to live their faith, but they really struggled with the Jewish people because the Jewish people wanted to worship God and only God. And that was in competition with their imperial cult because they wanted, they wanted all the people under Roman uh, occupation or under Roman authority to look up to the emperor as the benefactor, as the ultimate, as the son of God. And so they, they were really imposing things on Jews that would really uh, challenge them, like eating pork, um, worshiping Caesar, they were not allowed to circumcise their sons. And so they were trying to seduce them out of or force them out of their Jewish faith. And so you can see when Jesus walks in, what, do these, what were these people longing for? Freedom. We want these forces, we want Rome to be out of here. We want to go back to being able to worship freely. But Jesus, as I said, had a different way. And the symbol for this, for him, was a donkey. How many of you have seen donkeys in real life? A few. What's your impression of, of donkeys? Big ears. Big ears. <laughs> yes, true. <laughs> Unlike horse ears, yeah. Um, what else? What's the quality about a donkey? Stubborn. Stubborn, okay. They're humble. They're humble, very humble. Yes, they are stubborn and strong, but they also are used for service. Before, you know, today we have uh, trucks and ways to uh, move produce from one area to another, you know, when harvesting things. But in the old days, they had to rely on animals to carry stuff. And donkeys were these animals. And so they were very uh, much a symbol of the peasantry. So they were uh, used as you know, farm animals and, and helping people get to the market and all that good stuff. So Jesus couldn't have picked a better symbol for being a peasant king. He, was, he could have gone in on a horse, but what would have been the image for the people? He went back to, of course, to uh, prophecy about entering from the book of Zechariah, about entering as a humble king on a donkey and a colt. And that's uh, sometimes, you know, there's a mistranslation there. They're probably, I mean, try to imagine Jesus, according to the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus riding two animals. That's kind of a strange image. Uh, in the other Gospels, they correct it and they make it one. It, nevertheless, the whole idea is that Jesus used this image of a humble animal, a symbol of the working people, a symbol not of power, of violent power, but the power of love, of service. And so it was a very intentional uh, process for Jesus, and the invitation was to challenge those programs that we have as human beings for happiness, challenge our falsehoods about power, about you know esteem, about security, about control, all the things that lure us into believing that if we have these things, we're going to be happy. If we have these things, we're going to be peaceful. It, I mean, that's that's always the challenge. And you can look at other people and, and see it in other people a lot more easily than seeing it in yourself. Seeing it in other people or other nations, we can say, oh, you know, look, look, you know, how could they be doing this? But we ourselves are guilty. Even when, it, look, when you have somebody who is doing something clearly very wrong, it's always good to examine our motivations and how we react to the wrong that is being inflicted. And so Jesus was trying to help people take the long road, you know, the metaphor of the road and the parade, but to think of the road in terms of the road on this earth, but also to eternity. 
So thinking of our home being here on earth, but also we're citizens of a different realm, living by the values of the kingdom of God, not just living by our own values. And so today the invitation is to look at your life. You might be struggling yourself. You might be having a joyful time wherever you are on this path. Um, you might be struggling for somebody else to think about this image of the donkey, this challenge of Jesus entering in humble ways. How does it connect with you? How does it challenge you? How does it free you from the traps of trying to make life perfect or trying to make life fit all what you want and your expectations to really trusting that at the end of the day, it's really about this big picture of God's love. So we're going to end with a another video reflection and again invite you to go deep within and allow this story to speak to you about where you are right now. He rides into the holy city, entering its gates as king. Branches of palms laid at the feet, proclaiming victory. Not over conquered people, not over claimed lands, nor vanquished enemies, but ending the enmity between God and humanity. The evil of othering people for their differences, demonizing the sick and hurting the diseased and damaged, the ones pushed to the margins by politics and religious power, but by bringing them back into the holy house, the temple made not by stones, but by the flesh and bones of the one who in his body absorbed the hatred, the sickness and sin, the diseases and despair and gave back love and tenderness, wholeness and healing, compassion and commitment, whose domain is not borders and boundaries, countries and nations, not divides between us but the expanse of our hearts, the rule of peace that comes when enfleshing the life of each other, seeing all as sisters and brothers, as neighbor and friend, not as different, but as ourselves and another, mirrored as a reflection, the divine spark between us, the Prince of Peace who enters our hearts into the depths of our souls, the holiest of holies, seeing who we are, knowing every part of our being, the beneath the charade and disguises we sometimes make for ourselves, often two-faced and false, loyalty swaying, branches in the wind, being unraveled so what is beneath could come to the surface, to face the light and love, to see ourselves as we truly are, allied with the one who saw himself rejected and despised, disposable, but remade and rebuilt into a holy house, a sacred temple, body renewed, restored as the cornerstone, the foundation of God's hesed. God's tenacious and everlasting love, extreme love that endures forever.
Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able and sing uh, hymn number 91, Right On, Right On in Majesty. Friends, for the blessing, we do not know what the future will hold for us, but we are assured that whatever happens, God is with us. Follow Jesus boldly to the cross and beyond. You are beloved. And today uh, we are moving now from the celebration of Palm Sunday to Passion Week, to the passion part of this narrative, of this story, as Jesus heads into the heart of the darkness of humanity and the experience of Monday, Thursday, the Last Supper with the disciples, and then the crucifixion on Friday. I want to invite you to participate in this drama in your own way, whether it's at home or joining us. There will be a worship service on Thursday evening, uh, again, retelling that part of the story, and we invite you to join us, but also Friday at noon at City uh, Center outside if there's no wind inside, if the weather is not good. But the invitation is to think of the well-being of the city and to think and of the people who help uh, by giving of themselves in the way of love and compassion. So we'll be thanking the first responders, the healthcare workers, and invited to pray for the well-being of the city. And so uh, we will uh, be listening to an anthem uh, uh, were you there from the Joyful Ringers? And the invitation, again, is to open our hearts to that uh, passion of Jesus. As hard as it is for us and wanting to stay in the celebrations of Palm Sunday and then skip over to next Sunday, Easter, it is an invitation to enter into that difficult part.
Please turn to your neighbors and greet them with the peace of Christ.